Okay, next we're going to talk about the obvious aortic root and some of the valvular pathology. So, so far we've talked about pericardial effusion and tamponade. We've talked about left ventricular failure. We've talked about right ventricular dilation. Now we're going to get into the last question, which is the aortic root and obvious valvular pathology. Here are a couple of examples. First, the heart, because that's what we're going to start with. What I want you to notice here is this aortic root is dilated. Now, you can measure it if you want to, or you can just recognize that the right ventricle, the aortic root, in the left atrium should be about equal thirds. But in this scenario, one third is off, so the aortic root is dilated. If you measure it and it's more than four centimeters, then that's too big as well. This is probably the primary finding that's seen in Stanford type A aortic dissections. Maybe you'll see other things, but this is the most common thing that is seen on echocardiogram. And you can add to that diagnosis by getting other views of the aorta. So here are some views of the abdominal aorta where we see a winking flap inside the abdominal aorta in short axis or here in long axis and we can see that flap moves with the cardiac cycle. If we see some kind of horizontal line but it always keeps an equal distance and doesn't really move through the cardiac cycle then that's probably just an artifact. But this is a true dissection. It's moving through the cardiac cycle accompanied with a dilated aortic root. This is very concerning for Stanford type A dissection. High mortality the longer you wait to make this diagnosis. So as mentioned aortic root dilation is the most common thing we'll see on echo in aortic dissection. So that's one of the first things to train your eyeballs with. And if you want to measure it, it's more than four. Sometimes we may see a flap, which we'll see over here. This is just in comparison to this normal over here. And if we get our eyeballs on that descending thoracic aorta, we'll see the flap in the descending thoracic aorta as well. So there's the flap. The aortic root is also dilated, and we can see the flap in the descending aorta as well. Again, in comparison to normal, very obvious dilated root with a flap. There's also a pleural effusion over here. It goes behind the descending thoracic aorta. And if you're not using echocardiography in these patients, this is a diagnosis you're going to miss. In some patients, if it extends into the carotid and they have the right symptoms, you can look if you see a flap in the carotid, and the carotid is pretty easily accessible, then that can lend credence to a diagnosis of aortic dissection as well. That's something to think about. We don't necessarily do this in all patients, but if you're concerned and you're having trouble, this might give you additional diagnostic evidence. And like we talked about before, look at the abdominal aorta, and maybe you see a flap as well. So here's the abdominal aorta in cross-section. We see this flap that moves and changes positions with the cardiac cycle. Same thing here in long axis. I want to talk a little bit about this. There is a fair amount of literature on point of care users and aortic dissection and the quick summary of it is we can get views of the proximal aorta at the bedside. If their proximal aorta is normal and they're otherwise a pretty low risk patient, it's unlikely they have a type A dissection. And it has been pretty well documented that checking out the ascending aorta in these people with chest pain or other things will avoid misdiagnosis, improve our accuracy, will decrease delays to diagnosis and intervention, and even though the numbers are small, there are pretty decent trends and suggestions that lives are saved and mortality is decreased when we use bedside ultrasound to help us diagnose aortic dissection early in a patient's course. So this diagnosis can be hard to make, keeps me up at night. Bedside ultrasound definitely will help us make this diagnosis and avoid mistakes and mortality. And just like everything else, we have to be clinicians about this. We have to use all of our clinical skills in addition to ultrasound, we cannot truly exclude aortic dissection with bedside ultrasound or even transthoracic echo at all. If we have a significant suspicion, even if we don't have any findings on echo or ultrasound, we may need further workup like TE or CTA. So that just brings us back to the case, one of the cases we talked about at the beginning here, 59-year-old male, syncope, the real case by the way, heartburn just prior to syncope, no symptoms once they show up in the emergency department. Echo showed dilated aortic root. Additional findings in the abdomen showed signs of dissection. So this diagnosis was made in minute and luckily not missed. Couple quick things about some just real obvious valvular pathology. Some of this is things you're going to see and might throw you off if you just haven't seen it before. So I want to talk about them a little bit. A lot of our patients, especially our older patients or with other vascular disease, are going to have some calcium on their aortic valves. So we can see here, and normally the aortic valve is nice and thin, wispy. You should barely see the leaflets because they're nice and thin. If you see them and they're thick and bright and they're calcified, you can often even make a preliminary diagnosis of some aortic stenosis if you see that it's not opening 
doing well. You're not going to have true quantification of the severity, but you can at least say there's some degree of stenosis if it's thickened and not opening well. We can see that here as well. We see some calcium on the aortic valve, and if a patient has syncope or something else, this might raise your concern and expedite your need for a consultative echocardiogram to further quantify the severity of that stenosis. Other things that are very common, so mitral annular calcification. So we'll commonly see some calcification around the mitral annulus in a lot of our patients. Generally not clinically significant, although I will say aortic and mitral calcification are probably markers of other cardiovascular disease. So maybe, again, this is not truly evidence-based, but maybe be seeing calcification of the mitral annulus or the aortic valve might raise your suspicion that they've probably got some atheromatous changes in their coronaries or their aorta or otherwise. So kind of a soft marker, but also recognizing that these things themselves, especially mitral annular calcification, is almost never clinically significant. I want to differentiate that from something we don't see very much in the States, but rheumatic mitral stenosis. And what you'll see here is this kind of hockey sticking or hooking appearance of the mitral valve. This is a characteristic finding of mitral stenosis from rheumatic heart disease. It's actually almost pathognomonic for rheumatic heart disease. You'll see it on a rare occasion. Most of the time, it's certainly not an acute thing, but worth recognizing, worth having followed up and differentiating it from the mitral annular calcification, which is a pretty common finding and usually not immediately clinically significant. I'll also point out the little pericardial effusion here in this case that comes up anterior to the descending thoracic aorta. And then as we get a little bit of practice with our 2D images, we can start practicing with color. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with this here, but there are some scenarios where we want to recognize acute regurgitation. This is just an example of mitral regurgitation during systole. We see a big jet going back in the left atrium during systole. Most of the time, these aren't new acute immediate things, but there are a few scenarios where acute regurgitation from papillary rupture or endocarditis might be important. So there may be scenarios where these will come up. Generally though, it's important to get practice with your 2D images and recognizing the findings before you start getting more practice with color analysis. But like with all the rest of this, we've got to be clinicians. At the bedside, we don't have the time, the inclination. Probably most of us don't need or want or have the skill set to specifically quantify valve pathology. All of that can be done in the echo lab and then depending on the scenario will help guide us as far as the urgency of the need for consultative echo. There's a lot of information in there. Echocardiography can be complex. It can be a little challenging but it can also be one of the highest yield as far as helping our patients, decreasing morbidity and mortality. So I definitely think it is worth our time and attention to get good at. So a little summary about the decision making. Cardiac arrest, this can help us. We want to do this quickly. We want to try not to delay chest compressions. So we need to be very efficient and we can talk about this at another point, getting our views quickly and finding a good view. But one, is the heart beating or not? Because we're not as good at palpating pulses as we'd like to think we are. Is there something reversible? like tamponade that's causing this. Is there left ventricular failure? Now that is going to require a beating heart to help you diagnose, but that may help guide your decision making your treatment if you get a pulse back. Is there right ventricular dilation? Again, you're going to need a heart that's beating somewhere intermittently to help you decide if they truly have a dilated right ventricle or not. But that can again help you drive your decision making as far as is this an acute PE? Maybe is this a TPA candidate or not? Or do they have a dilated aortic root where dissection may be a cause? And if you get them back, that may help driver decision making. So you can find one, is there cardiac activity that you're not detecting by palpating pulses? The next thing is, are there reversible things like tamponade? If you have the patient who's not in cardiac arrest, but they're showing up with shock, hypotension, you can ask yourself a few questions that we're not as good at differentiating clinically as we'd like to think we are. So the first one is, is this obstructive shock? Because obstructive shock, you're going to treat much differently than some of your other forms of shock. And then is it left ventricular failure? Because if it's left ventricular failure, then you're going to be a little more judicious with the fluids that you give and a little more careful with that. The next thing is, is there a dilated aortic root? And usually if they've got a dilated aortic root accompanying with shock, then we have to think about dissection. So combining this with our clinical findings can help us be much more accurate in diagnosing shock. And we're going to do an upcoming discussion specifically focused on shock and some more of the details of how to look for and how to work through the decision making. And then in patients who maybe aren't that sick, right? They're not in cardiac arrest, they're not in shock, but how can we still use bedside echocardiogram to help us with our decision making? So we're talking about patients with symptoms like chest pain, shortness of breath, palpitations, syncope or near syncope. So what can we do? So it's really two things. 
things. One, recognize things that we don't expect, like cardiomyopathies or PE or other things that just, you know, patients can look well, especially if they're healthy. They can kind of hide these things physiologically from us. So echo can help us in making sure there are not unexpected findings like tamponade or cardiomyopathy or some obvious valve pathology. As we alluded to or talked about a little bit before, assessing their heart can help us in our risk stratification. So normal gross chamber sizes and function are positive prognostic indicators that can help us with these patients and tailor our plans a little bit more. And also if the patients see what we're doing, gives them a little more comfort as well. In summary for bedside echocardiogram, adds useful information that we cannot get by EKG, x-ray, history and physical. Does require practice. So you got to just practice getting a lot of images. It's worth doing a bedside echo on anybody who's getting an EKG, looking at a lot of cases. And then just remember, we have to be clinicians and there are certain things that can only be looked at with some more detailed measurements in the echo lab. Remember the five questions. Is the heart beating? Is there pericardial effusion? Is the left ventricle failing? Is the right ventricle dilated? Is there obvious valvular or aortic root pathology? That's all on the heart. Next up, we're going to be talking about pairing the heart with the lungs and how that can help us more quickly make some diagnoses. So see you back when it's time for the lungs.